Hello, and welcome to the third program in the series, Racism is a Public Health Issue, Essentially Forgotten, How COVID-19 Impacts Frontline Workers. My name is Christine Y. Kim. I'm a curator of contemporary art at LACMA and also co-founder of Kyopo, both of whom are very pleased to co-present today's program with Arte Americas, Four Freedoms, and Stop Discrimination. Please follow these incredible organizations and the work that they are doing. This series, Racism is a Public Health Issue, started with addressing prejudices against Asian Americans during the COVID-19 pandemic with speakers Jeff Chang, Russell Jung, Kathy Park Hong, Bon Yang, and Anika Yi, moderated by Kibom Kim on May 7th, followed by examining the impact of police brutality on Black communities in the age of COVID-19, with speakers Erica Bass, Ava DuVernay, Darnell Hunt, and Rashid Johnson, moderated by Naima Keith on July 21st. When I first approached Rita Gonzalez, Naima Keith, and Michael Govan at LACMA to host the first one, not only was their response unanimously positive, they came back asking for this entire series. So I am very grateful. Although this is our final program in this historic series, which turned to art and culture at the intersection of equity, race, and the pandemic um, have exceeded our expectations, it will not be our last effort at unpacking racial and social inequities alongside global and national issues. Whether through art, film, poetry, performance, literature, or any other art form, LACMA is a county institution committed to inclusion in the arts and discourse in a public forum. This could not be a more precarious and anxious driving moment in our electoral purgatory, our downward ecological and environmental spiral, the largest protests in US history and racial reckoning, and a foreign affairs international relations nightmare. As all of the numbers of number of deaths from COVID-19 are expected by some counts to reach nearly half a million people by the end of the year in the United States alone. Since the COVID-19 pandemic began, many frontline workers have been exposed to flagrantly unsafe work conditions. Janitors, house cleaners, nannies, warehouse, food processing, and factory workers, construction workers, letter carriers, grocery store employees, drivers, delivery people, cooks, servers, bus boys, dishwashers, receptionists, cashiers, farm workers, teachers, transit workers, security, alongside home care workers, doctors, nurses, technicians, aides, and hospital staff caring for patients have been deprived of basic deserved protection. Although some of the challenges workers are facing are new and specific to the pandemic, many are the shameful consequence of decades long exploitative practices, especially those affecting workers of low wage jobs Many of the top essential occupations deliver the very lowest wages. Since March, thousands of frontline workers have died. New analysis by Amnesty International has found that at least 1,077 healthcare workers have been confirmed to have died after contracting COVID-19 in the US. This figure is only surpassed by one other country in the world, Mexico, at 1,320 deaths. We may never know the accurate number of frontline worker deaths due to COVID. Out of the nearly 200,000 people in our country lost since March because they are not tracked by any federal agency. However, we do know that the pandemic is amplifying a vast economic and racial divide in our country's workforce. It has been ascertained that essential workers are disproportionately Black, Indigenous, and people of color, or BIPOC, with many sectors staffed predominantly by immigrants. According to the Economic Policy Institute, BIPOC account for 43% of all essential workers, while accounting for 40% of the total population. However, in some places in the US, including epicenters of the outbreak, BIPOC workers represent a huge share of the frontline workforce, such as 75% in New York City. Here in California, 
Latinxs are 39% of the state's population, but represent 60% of coronavirus cases and 50% of deaths through August, according to the State Department of Public Health. And these numbers are just astounding and really hard to, to wrap my head around. 55% of Latinx people and 48% of Black people in California are employed in these essential jobs. Years of structural racism in housing, education, and across many industries have contributed to the overrepresentation of minority workers in typically low wage so called essential positions. These are jobs held by those whose physical presence at work sites cannot be replaced by telework. Many of these workers also have limited access to healthcare services, secure housing, and often do not receive family sick leave if exposed to the virus. Furthermore, workers with undocumented status are disqualified entirely from unemployment, safety net programs, along with the aforementioned necessities. This gravely impacts the Latinx population who account for 90% of California's agricultural workers, 60% of whom are unauthorized to work legally in the US and are totally unprotected. America's domestic workers and personal care aides, who are mostly women of color and immigrants, are also exceptionally vulnerable. Despite the grueling, indispensable work provided to keep food on our tables and our families and homes cared for, these populations are left to weather the COVID-19 pandemic under radically disparate safety and security measures than the rest of the population. Tonight, we are joined by five distinguished community organizers, leaders, scholars, and cultural producers who will discuss their own work and address the need and ways to prioritize providing essential workers with dignity, protection, and representation, both during the pandemic as well as beyond. But before I introduce our speakers and moderator, I would like to welcome Supervisor Sheila Kuehl, Los Angeles County Supervisor of the Third District to the virtual stage to make a very special address. Supervisor Kuehl, thank you very much for joining us this evening. Thank you so much, Christine. I'm really pleased to be here. And it's a great pleasure to welcome all of you to LACMA's final Racism is a Public Health Issue webinar, this one focusing, as you've heard, on essential workers. I'm very, very happy that LACMA has put this series together, and even more happy that you're all here to discuss this very, very important issue. You know, over the last several months, more and more people have finally come to understand mm -hmm. the pervasiveness and persistence of racism and the impact that it has on housing, on education, and of course, on healthcare. COVID-19 has made it heartbreakingly clear how stark our racial disparities are. You probably already know, and you were listening when Christine told you, that many, many of our low-income, frontline, and essential workers disproportionately Latinx, African-American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islanders have borne the brunt of this virus, even as they put their own lives on the line. Many of them couldn't even afford to call in sick for fear of losing their income or losing their jobs entirely. My colleagues and I on the board took an important step recently, a uh, somewhat unusual one, I'm pleased to say or sad to say, for a county board of supervisors, declaring racism in officially in the county to be a public health crisis. And just this past week, took another important step in calling for the creation of an office of labor equity to help advocate for and develop better protections for workers, including empowering them to report the public health violations in their own workplace directly to us mm -hmm. and not having to worry about retaliation at the workplace. It is nothing short of tragedy that the people on whom we have most depended have had to risk their lives while protecting ours. So thank you, thank you all again for being part of this important and ongoing conversation. I know that you will be deeply interested in the webinar. I thank all the panelists for all of their work over decades. It adds up to more than a century of work among all of them, young as they are. 
and I thank you for allowing me to give this welcome. Back to you, Christine. Thank you so much, Supervisor Kuehl, for this very important, meaningful, and significant address. I am honored and grateful to welcome our four esteemed panelists and moderators, starting with the legendary Dolores Huerta, who will be our first speaker. Dolores Huerta is a civil rights activist and community organizer who has worked for labor rights and social justice for over 50 years. She founded the United Farm Workers Union with Cesar Chavez in 1962 and has played a crucial role in many of the union's accomplishments until now. She established the Dolores Huerta Foundation, which is working to register and educate voters, is an advocate for education reform and for greater equality for the LGBT community and so much more. Welcome, Dolores Forza. Our next speaker will be Gabby C. Gabby is the political director for 1199 SIEU United Healthcare Workers East, which she oversees, which she oversees the union's political, legislative, and policy work in New York, New Jersey, Massachusetts, Maryland, Washington, D.C., and Florida. She has led electoral issue and advocacy campaigns at the local, state, and national level. Welcome, Gabby. It's wonderful to have you here. Our third speaker will be Jess Morales Roqueto. Jess Morales Roqueto works with domestic workers to defend and expand their rights and educate the public about humanistic labor organizing. She's the political, political director of the National Domestic Workers Alliance collaborating with thousands of nannies, house cleaner, cleaners, and care workers all over the country to pass legislation such as the Domestic Worker Bill of Rights. Roqueto has also been the co-chair of Family Belong Together Coalition, a campaign that has been instrumental in raising awareness and funding for thousands of families who have been separated and detained at the border. It's wonderful to have you here, Jess, thank you. And last but not least, Narciso Martinez is a contemporary artist whose work explores his personal experience within the agricultural industry. Through juxtaposing imagery, such as produce labels and reclaimed boxes and portraits of agricultural workers, he reflects on the economic systems that contribute to huge disparities in the lifestyles of the producer and the consumer. Martinez sees his work as a catalyst for discussions about the common ground between the well-off and the less fortunate. Martinez has received the Rima Hortman Foundation Grant for Emerging Artists and the Stanley Hollander Award for both in 2019. In each of these programs in the series, we have included artists and cultural producers like Narciso with an understanding that art provides a vital and expansive forum for engagement, discussion, elevation, coalition building, and creativity. We in the arts truly believe la cultura Cura, culture heals. Each speaker will be spotlighted for eight to 10 minutes, led by our moderator, director, and professor of the UCLA Chicano Studies Research Center, Sean Noriega. He will then lead the panelists in a group discussion before opening it up to questions. I thank you all for joining us for this final program in the Racism is a Public Health Issue series. And um, this panel will appear on LACMA's YouTube channel. Thank you so much and take care. Thank you, Christine. Uh, and to everyone at LACMA for starting this important series on racism as a public health issue. And thank you, uh, Supervisor Sheila Kuehl. Today's panel looks at essential workers in agriculture, healthcare, and domestic work. These are the people who make our society function at its most basic levels of food, well-being and shelter, but they are also the most vulnerable population before COVID-19 and especially so now. Now here's the cruel irony. No one questions the importance of essential services in our society. Government acts to ensure that these services continue in hard times, but the worker is treated as expendable. Essential worker, essential work, expendable worker, and race, is core to this disparity and must be addressed. 
The issue extends beyond the worker him or herself, since essential workers are not sheltering in place or working remotely. They and their children are more likely to test positive for COVID-19 and less likely to have access to health care. In some areas in our country, as many as half the children have tested positive. Today's panel addresses these issues impacting agriculture, health care, and domestic workers. You'll hear from activists and artists who are fighting for the visibility, voice, and essential rights of workers. It is my honor to introduce our first speaker, someone who has been a leader and an inspiration for me and countless others in the fields of social justice and labor rights for 65 years, Dolores Huerta. Thank you very much, uh, John, Mr. Noriega. Uh, thank you very much also uh, to the uh, Alicante Museum for doing this uh, webinar. It's so, so important right now uh, in this crisis that we're living in right now. And yes, it is so sad to see that our essential workers are not protected the way that they should be. I'm here in the Central Valley of California. I'm here in Bakersfield. Our cases of COVID are off the roof. I mean, there are so many people that have gotten infected, so many people that have died, and it's unnecessarily so, because they did not receive the protections that they needed, principally by, from their employers, who should have been taking care of them at the very, very beginning. Yes, they're out there making sure, the farm workers especially, that we get our food every single day, and yet they are not protected. And we know that this whole idea of racism, it comes from slavery. It comes from domination. And the whole idea that people should work for nothing. And yes, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said that racism is an illness, and it is. And so we have to think of ourselves as those that are going to go out there and to heal our country, you know, heal our, heal, heal our society. Because while people of color are the victims of racism, the police slayings, the low wages, uh, all of the things that we can think of that uh, people of color are impacted by, especially now with COVID-19, which shown, has shown the spotlight on everything that is wrong from income inequality to police lanes, et cetera. It's also an illness that affects the people who are racist. When we think of that 17 year old young kid who killed people, and they, by the way, they were Anglos, the ones that he killed, that kid is going to spend his life in prison. And we know that racism comes from their culture, from their family traditions, and that there is a way actually uh, to get rid of racism. But in order to make that happen, we're all going to have to jump in, every single public organization, private organization, every corporation, every nonprofit organization, we have got to put this on the top of our agenda uh, to make sure that all of us can, you know, get in there like you are doing here at the museum uh, to everybody, uh, you know, give their stories, uh, give their examples, show people why racism is bad, but not only that, but how we can end it. And one of the ways that we know that we can end it, of course, is through education and through cooperation and through sharing. Uh, it, this is a way by each one of us reaching out to somebody else and, and not giving up on them because, and, and not getting angry, not hating people who are not yet ready to receive our message. We just have to keep trying and organizing and talking and making sure that people will understand. Yes, there is a way that we can do this, but it's got to, you know, we have to make sure that people in the first place understand and that they are not in denial, that they know that racism exists and we are in such a great position right now that we can actually point out with statistics and facts and things that are going on right now every single day in our country right now to show why racism needs to end and that we are the ones that can do that. What do we say? We can say, si se puede. Yes, we can. Each and every one of us can put in our two cents, to put in our time and do whatever we can uh, to end racism. This is something that I have been committed to all of my entire life because I, like many people who are going to watch this webinar, have all, I've been a victim of racism. I've been a victim of sexism. You know, I've been a victim of police brutality. So, it, it, but, but at the same time, when, when, I, when I say all of those issues, like so many of us, uh, at the same time, I really do have to say that I do believe in nonviolence. I believe that this is the way that we can confront all of the challenges that we have and that we do not have to turn to violence. And if we can just share our stories with others and make them understand, yes, that we can win, but we have to organize, you know, we have to 
we have to vote, uh, you know, we have to go out there and do the hard work that it takes uh, to be able to end the racism in our society. And when we think of racism, you know, right now we're celebrating 100 years of women's suffrage. And we know that uh, when we talk about sexism and, and uh, homophobia, these all kind of stain from the same evil root of slavery because it's all about domination. It's about who can take advantage of somebody else. And so we kind of have to go back to our indigenous roots, you know, and our indigenous roots are those of sharing, of cooperation, because we know that none of us would have survived on our planet had we not cooperated and, and, and trusted and, and protected each other at the very beginning. And we always have to remember that we are all one human race. We are homo sapiens and our human race came from Africa. So that makes all of us Africans of different shades and colors. And I love to say this, we can say to all the white national, nationalists out there, all the neo-Nazis out there, the white supremacists, get over it. You are also Africans, okay? And we are one human race. And I just wanna suggest something else here. Let's not ever use the word race unless it's attached to the word human. Human race, one species, homo sapiens. We have a lot of different ethnic groups. We have a lot of different nationalities, but we only have one human race and that is us. And again, the only way we survived on this planet was to take care of each other, to cooperate with each other and to protect each other. Cause we are some of the smallest animals. We would have been much for some big dinosaur or some or some large, maybe dinosaurs weren't around when we, when we came on this planet, but there are definitely larger animals than us that would have had us for lunch had we not ourselves been able to take care of each other. And this is what COVID-19 has taught us, that we have to protect and we have to take care of each other because if we do not, then all of us are in peril. And we can say that when racism exists, at the extent that it now exists, yes, we are all in peril because the consequences of racism are so huge. We're talking about mass incarcerations, people that are very, very poor, the inequality, the effects it has on housing, on education, on health. All of these are the manifestations of racism. And yes, we have to end it and we can do it. And now is the time. Si se puede. Thank you so much, Dolores, uh, for these amazing words. You, you really um, given a great focus and a breath to what we're trying to do here. And I wanna thank you for really leading with love and through your career, also putting your body on the line. I've seen that and it is an inspiration, I think, to, to most of us that um, what you've done here is to really make clear that while we may be focusing on race, we may be focusing on public health, so many other aspects of how our society renews itself are so central to that. Uh, you mentioned education, suffrage, the right to vote, to be a part of the formation of a society. And I would also add food insecurity. The fact that the children of farm workers should be having food insecurity is a direct impact to their education, their health, and their well-being. Now, I want to just end by acknowledging the one thing you've brought up that is really core to and will need to be core to our thinking, and that is a commitment to the hard work that is called upon for everyone, uh, not just some, that this is something, as you said, we all have to jump in on this and make it our top priority. Now with that, I'd like to turn to our next speaker who uh, will bring us to the other side of the country uh, and from a focus on farm work to healthcare workers, and that is Gabby C. Thank you so much, Sean, and thanks um, first to one of my personal heroes, Ms. Wertha, who uh, for being a young woman in the labor movement, we all look up to her um, and, and really set an example. So it's just an honor to be on the same panel with her. And thank you to LASMA for inviting this New Yorker to be a part of this conversation. I wanna just talk to you about two things. I wanna to talk to you about health disparities, but I wanna to talk to you about healthcare workers. Um, there's a saying in the African-American community that when America gets a cold, black folks get pneumonia. And I think that's not just true of black folks, 
but all people of color, particularly um, low income workers and immigrants. That when we see a health crisis exist in America, it is that much worse for communities of color. And when we look at the determinants, the social determinants of health and health outcomes, there are kind of six categories that we look at. We look at things that are obvious, like access to quality health care. We look at the social security and not social security that we pay into and support our seniors, but the social um, safety net that exists around an individual. We look at their access to food and to healthy food um, and, uh, and, and if they are able to readily um, get their hands on it. And then we look at three other things, the three E's, education, economics, and their environment, the neighborhood where they are actually living. And if we think about the experiences of black and brown people in this country, and we think about those six categories that determine one's health outcomes, there is no question why uh, we see health disparities between white Americans and Americans of color. It is no question why 21% of Latinx folks over the age of 20, uh, over the age of 20 have diabetes compared to 13% of white Americans over the age of 20. It's, 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 it's understandable and shameful that the leading cause of death for black men in America is heart disease, that 80% of black women are, are obese compared to 65% of black, uh, or, I'm sorry, 65% of white women, or that 16% of Latinx people do, are uninsured as opposed to 6% of white Americans. None of these, social determinants, whether it's education, the environments and neighborhoods that we live in, have ever been equitably applied to people of color since our existence in America. And so when we look at this COVID crisis that happened, and we started to see who was most impacted by it, if there's no surprise that communities of color. Now, when we think about healthcare workers, the other thing I want to talk about, we often give credit to those um, that provide the direct care, the nurses, the doctors, the respiratory therapist, some essential work that was being done during COVID. We think about the certified nursing assistants, and these are the, the, the women and the men that provide uh, care to individuals in nursing homes and other adult uh, living facilities, or home health aides, or personal care attendants. Those are the healthcare workers that we often think about. Um, what we don't think about is the support system that allows all these caregivers to give that work. I'm talking about the environmental services worker that ensures every hospital room or nursing home facility is spotless and clean and sanitized, which was so important, so much more important during COVID because there was so much that we did not know about this disease when it hit our shores. Um, I'm talking about the folks that provide food to folks that are in facilities. I'm talking about the workers that on the back end are doing the coding and billing. And unfortunately, we still live in a healthcare system where having access to insurance is dependent upon if you have a good job or if you're just lucky enough to live in a state like California or, or New York that expanded Medicare or Medicaid under the Affordable Care Act to have access to that. And most importantly, we don't think about and consider the folks that are the first face that hit uh, that a uh, person that's walking into the ER, the first face that they see is not one of a nurse oftentimes, it's just a registrar, someone who is taking uh, your information when you are most scared um, and most unsure about what's going on. These are all healthcare workers. And as Christine mentioned before, these are largely people of color, particularly in long-term care, home health aides and personal care attendants and certified nursing assistants, CNAs. So we think about healthcare workers and who they are, and if we also think about health disparities that exist in our country, we got hit by the perfect storm of COVID-19, and it impacted healthcare workers so, so tremendously. The first way that it impacts healthcare workers is because, like I said, many of them are people of color. Um, I think about one of our members, his name is Gary, he works um, at a hospital uh, in Far Rockaway, and if you know anything about the geography of New York City, Far Rockaway is just the most east part of our city, um, and uh, it's almost entirely black and brown individuals, and there's just one hospital, St. John's, that, that serves that entire community. Gary was a morgue attendant, and so he was quite used to, you know, dealing with uh, deceased bodies and deceased persons and their families, um, and so he was prepared for that because that was the job that he did for so long. But what he was unprepared for were the, the hundreds of friends 
and families and folks that he saw in his community every day having to, to carry their bodies. And we all saw the reports of bodies uh, in refrigerated trucks. And I think for any person that ever had to see that and a person who had to live it every day and not just live it as abstract, but for so many of our workers, not just Gary, they didn't have, um, patients didn't have access to their families. They weren't allowed in facilities. So these healthcare workers, whether they were an environmental services worker or dietary, or even the morgue attendant, were the only folks that had access to families or sometimes to the patient. And so they became their extended family. So just imagine how healthcare, the mental effects that healthcare workers were fighting COVID on the front lines in their everyday jobs, but also in their homes and taking care of the people that they knew and loved. We also saw that show up when, when healthcare workers had, had to make very hard decisions about whether they would go to work or not. We had a personal care attendant, a member in, in Massachusetts, who decided to move in with her clients. Um, instead of risking carrying the virus from a client to her client because she had to take public transit to get there every day or to her family. It wasn't an option for her not to work. Um, and so she just moved in and that meant that she was gonna have to be available to her client 24 hours a day, but that was some, a sacrifice she was willing to make in order to care for her family because her family uh, were, were people of color who she knew were gonna be disproportionately impacted the second way that this impacted, and we talked a little bit about this already, was the protection that was afforded to healthcare workers. We all know that there was a, just a global shortage in proper uh, personal protective equipment. Um, and it took several months for us to get enough to actually feel comfortable that every healthcare worker was uh, had the protection that they need to be able to provide the care that they have all trained to be able to do. Um, many healthcare jobs uh, are not high paying jobs. The median uh, income for uh, home health care aid is $12.15 an hour. The median income for a certified nursing assistant was $14.25. And these are the workers that are lifting people up every day, helping them make their way around the house, cleaning up, feeding them, making sure they have round the clock care. And thankfully, folks that are in a union like 1199 SEIU, where we represent half a million workers, healthcare workers up and down the East Coast, they have access and we bargain hard for them to have access to hate sick leave. But for the millions of workers that aren't represented by unions like 1199, they had no access. And one of the most shameful things we saw the federal government do in this coronavirus response in their first bill uh, to, uh, to, to support um, those being impacted in the communities being impacted by the coronavirus explicitly excluded healthcare workers, the people who were fighting this on the front lines. And so when we talk about access to paid sick leave, so many workers had to choose not between staying home and taking, and taking, taking care of their families and taking care of their patients. They had no other choice because they would be out of a job. Um, and so when we think about the support that is needed, and the fact that there are still so many workers that have not been re rewarded for putting themselves on the line, particularly our home care workers, our personal health care assistants, we're still waiting for the federal government to recognize their labor. We're still waiting for the federal government to ensure that local governments like the city of Los Angeles and the city of New York have the proper funding to be able to support folks going forward because we are gonna find ourselves in a very unfortunate situation if we don't take care of this right now where the very folks that we call heroes throughout this pandemic, we're gonna be called layoff workers if we do not, if the federal government does not take action uh, to support, protect these workers. So if there is one thing, I'm an organizer, so I can't leave this call without asking you to do one thing. And particularly if you live in a state where one of your senators, and unfortunately that's entirely on partisan lines, if you live in a state where you have a senator that has not supported the HEROES Act, has not supported the hazard pay uh, that many um, folks across the, the spectrum, the political spectrum have been talking about, call your senators and tell them to pass the HEROES Act to ensure that essential workers not only get the recognition that they need, but the pay that they need to take care of their families in the long run. Thank you so much, John. Thank you, uh, Gabby. That was really wonderful and, and depressing at the same time. Um, and I really appreciate your broadening uh, the definition of healthcare worker to include those, uh, the large, much larger number of people who 
are on the front lines and who are spending the most time uh, with uh, people who need health care. And I just want to point out, just, uh, and, and this will come up in our discussion, the, the, dis the, the contradictions in a lot of the attitudes towards the frontline workers. I did a survey a few years ago of conservative uh, whites in Orange County about their attitudes towards immigrants. And they almost universally supported undocumented minors, uh, access to education, pathways to citizenship. But they felt their parents who took care of their homes, uh, who provided health care services for them, that they should be deported. And it, it, was, it was hard to really kind of square these two things, a, a lack of empathy directly at odds even with one's own self-interest. And I think with that, I, you know, it, it, as a segue, I'd like to uh, introduce uh, Jess Morales Roqueto, who's with the National Domestic Workers Alliance. Um, to really bring some attention there in terms of those who are most closely associated with the homes that ostensibly we are making, but are actually part of a much larger group effort that goes unrecognized. Uh, Jess. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that segue. It's a really, it was a really helpful segue actually. Um, I just wanna say thank you to our Bay Americas for Freedoms, GYOPO, Black Men to Stop Discrimination, folks who invited us to do this panel. I, um, I'm already so excited at uh, being with my, my comrade, Gabby, and, and also, of course, with uh, Dolores. It's such an honor uh, to always be in her presence. Um, I am Jess morales Riquetto, the Civic Engagement Director at the National Domestic Workers Alliance. I run campaigns and elections work um, at, um, the largest uh, organization in the country to support domestic workers. And in case you're not familiar with domestic workers, you may not know them by that name, but you probably know about nannies, um, elder or home care workers, and housekeepers. So these are the folks that make pretty much all other work possible. And I know that in this time, um, the work of caring for our elders, caring for our children, keeping our homes clean, has taken on really new resonance, which I'll talk about a little bit. Um, the National Domestic Workers Alliance has been around for about a decade. We're led by um, our visionary leader, Ai-jen Poo. Um, and we are really rooted in the folks that we represent. Uh, we believe deeply in worker democracy um, and making sure that we are led by um, the people that um, are closest to the problems who we believe are also closest to the solutions. Um, this time has uh, of, of the pandemic has been really um, uh, uh, both eye-opening and also kind of affirmed many, many things that we already knew. So one of the ways that we talk about this, um, similar to, to Gabby and, and sort of the heroes kind of narrative that she was talking about, is around this idea of essential work, which now I think is um, really permeated our kind of collective consciousness, but really was one of the, uh, is, you know, that's like pandemic invention. We didn't really talk about essential work necessarily before this, but you know, I think a lot of people talk about essential workers now. Um, and a, a thing that has been amazing has been the expansion of this idea of whose work is essential. Um, not just, uh, um, as Gabby was talking about, doctors or nurses, but also grocery store workers, cleaning staff, domestic workers, farm workers who put foods on our table. And that's been a really important shift that we have seen over the course um, of the last couple of months. And that shift needs to continue, not just in this pandemic, but also as we go forward. As we think about um, essential work, we also kind of think about what we call the triple pandemic. So there is the crisis of COVID-19, the public health crisis that is happening. There is the economic crisis that is the recession. Um, and you know, I would say that uh, at this point, uh, it is safe to say that the economic crisis that we're in is worse than the Great Depression. So there has been almost no other time, arguably there has been no other time worse um, in America's economy, in our country's history. Um, and we anticipate that potentially continuing. And then also the crisis of racism, specifically anti-Black violence and specifically anti-Black police violence. Those triple crises together, those triple pandemics together are essential, I think, in understanding how we think about um, uh, racism as it pertains both to economic justice, but also racial justice 
um, and uh, and health justice and, and what we're trying to to make sure how we make sure people are safe. Um, our organization traditionally focuses on organizing workers around their uh, uh, workers' rights, labor and economic justice is where we really live. But over the course of the, of the COVID pandemic, we have kind of taken an unprecedented step in our um, organization's history and started something called the Coronavirus Care Fund. The Coronavirus Care Fund, when we started, we thought, um, we launched in early March, right, right at the beginning here, we thought if we raised $4 million, that seemed like a very kind of hairy, big, tough to get at goal. Um, we could help 10,000 workers um, be able to make a $400 payment, which um, is somewhat famously the amount that people um, usually need to spend in a crisis that they don't have saved. We knew that that wouldn't uh, kind of help everybody, but that people needed immediate relief. As we were thinking about how do we help our folks, what we found was that the number one thing that people needed was cash. We're not really in the business of giving people cash, but that's what they needed. So we um, we kind of took this very unprecedented step given that the times we're in and launched the Coronavirus Care Fund. Over the last few months, we have been just completely astonished at the outpouring of support that we have um, received for the Coronavirus Care Fund and we raised $31 million to give $400 payments to workers. Now, that is, remember I said we thought we would raise $4 million and we raised $31 million. So kind of unprecedented success that we almost like couldn't imagine would happen. However, even as much as we raised, which will help tens of thousands of workers, Ultimately, that's only about 5% of the 2.5 million domestic workers in this country. Um, remember what I said also, we're the largest group to help domestic workers. So that means that even the kind of like biggest, wildly beyond our dreams, successful amount of money that we could raise um, and the support that we could provide, that is really helping such a tiny sliver of the people that we um, are, exist to uh, support and serve. And the reason that I raise that is not because I'm not really proud of our success. I'm incredibly, um, it, it's, it's like both um, makes me full of pride for the work that we do, but also kind of affirms my faith in humanity and people wanting to support one another and stand up, um, you know, ordinary people kind of standing up in these extraordinary times. But it's that even in the face of all of that extraordinary action by regular people, this is really still a government sized problem. It requires government size solutions. Um, and many of our workers, uh, we represent a almost entirely female workforce, um, almost entirely women of color, um, especially Latina and, and um, Black women, although also a fair amount of API women as well. And um, about over half of our workforce is immigrant. So these are workers who make um, a on a good year between average salary between eleven and twelve thousand dollars a year. So um, this, these are these are our poor folks who really live not just on the poverty line but well below the poverty line, the most marginalized, most vulnerable in our society and in the workplace. And they have been left out of federal relief. You know, these are folks who at the same time are risking their lives to keep the country running because they're the ones who are caring for our elders. They're the ones who are cleaning the homes that we are spending all of our time in. They are the ones who um, are supporting our children. And we should be really clear that that risk is also, as Gabby said, collides with the disproportionate impact that COVID is having on those communities. You know, at the beginning of the pandemic, a lot of times people were saying, you know, everyone, we're all the same, we're all experiencing, um, you know, this time together, um, you know, th this is like a great equalizer, COVID is a great equalizer. Um, and I think it's really important to kind of dismantle that idea. Um, what has actually happened is that the pandemic didn't really unearth something that was, um, uh, that didn't exist before, it actually just unearthed what was wrong with our country. We don't have mandatory paid sick leave. We don't have family leave. We don't have universal family care. People don't have access to PPE. We're still operating on the systems of oppression that got people into those workplaces in the first place. And all of that really matters because I would say COVID has not equalized us. In fact, COVID has just 
really thrown open the doors of the inequity and racism that already existed in our system. And then you're seeing that in the impact that COVID is having. These kind of generations of systemic barriers from inadequate housing and childcare, food insecurity have created a sort of perfect storm of racial oppression. And that means that black people in America are particularly suffering from the health and economic crisis caused by COVID. So if we're not centering in particular black people in the conversation about public health and COVID response, then you're really not having the conversation. One of the things that we've been doing, and then I'll wrap up, is every single week uh, since March, we've been surveying 10,000 workers from a, a Facebook bot. So these are mostly, this is a Spanish bot, um, but we have, um, uh, and these are mostly housekeepers. So it's a little bit specific, but I say that because I talked a bunch just now about um, kind of what the effect of COVID has been on Black communities specifically, and now kind of want to move talking about Latina communities. These are monolingual Spanish speakers from all over the country who are housekeepers, and what we found is that only 36% of domestic workers went back to work in July. That means a huge portion of um, the market is not reopening as the country is reopening. They have lost clients, even the ones that are going back to work are working fewer hours. Um, the majority, the vast majority of women that we talk to are reporting that they're working 10 hours or less than they were before the coronavirus, and they're getting paid less than they were getting paid. So when we hear conversations about hazard pay, what we're actually finding with domestic workers is that not only are they not getting hazard pay that they deserve for care during this time, they're actually being paid less wages than they were paid before the pandemic, even as their risk has greatly increased. Um, uh, and then, you know, what we're also finding is that federal relief, which has been wholly inadequate, has not come to many of our Latino workers. They are immigrants who are left out of federal relief packages. The majority of people that we've talked to, over 57%, I said they were unable to pay their rent and mortgage in July. And we know that it's only going to get worse because some, you know, we've seen kind of drop off around the amount of support. We are finding that many workers are questioning whether or not they will be able to stay in the domestic work market um, because they don't know when uh, the market will open back up and they'll be able to do their work. That is a really big problem um, because again, these are women who live well below the poverty line. They are having to make choices like going to work for a client and keeping their own children at home um, unsupervised so that they can go to work. The reason that they have to go to work is because they cannot pay the rent. They cannot pay their phone bill. Um, they don't know where their next meal is coming from. Food banks are completely overwhelmed. Um, and so this is a really big problem, even in the face of, of some states where they have done, like in California, for instance, um, eviction moratoriums, these are not rent forgiveness. So that just means that for three months, they haven't been able to pay rent and they're accumulating, you know, uh, potentially thousands of dollars of debt, which they will obviously not be able to pay off. So the situation is incredibly dire. Um, and it's really important for, you know, I think us to understand all this richness is complexity, particularly as we're getting into this reopening phase. Who is the world reopening for? And who is affected by that reopening is a question I think all of us need to ask ourselves because I think what we'll find is that the people who are most marginalized continue to be the most marginalized and the most at risk. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Jess. And I really want to emphasize um, <clears throat> what you bring up here in terms of scale. And I think it's amazing what you've been able to do, the range of activities that, and fronts that you're working on and the, the funding you've been able to raise. But I think what becomes the most daunting element of this from the activist side, but also I think from the uh, person on the street side, is the scale of it goes beyond what uh, a self-selected group of individuals can do. And it really does call for a government, uh, which is the foundation of a society um, to really address. This cannot be dealt with by individuals sending donations or even by the foundations that we have. We have so many extremely large foundations and any one of them is no larger than a mid-sized city government. Uh, and we're talking about addressing the needs of an entire nation of over 330, 40 million people. So with that, what I'd like to do is, is turn to our last speaker and our artist uh, for the day, 
Narciso Martinez, who really shifts that scale to the individual, the ground level, uh, and the kind of visualizing of what's happening uh, at, at an experiential level that then builds up to uh, the kind of uh, societal understanding. And he does this through the personal experiences as an immigrant uh, from Oaxaca, Mexico, and as a farm worker, and as somebody who, like myself, has really followed that path uh, of, of education as an adult um, uh, without uh, the usual support uh, that one would, uh, one would hope for, and can really attest to a lot of what we've been talking about at the ground level through the arts. So, Narciso? So, hey, uh, thank, thank, thank you, everybody. And um, uh, it's really such an honor to get to know each and every one of you. Thank you for giving the opportunity to uh, share some of my art and some of my experiences here with the community. Um, I think we're going to see some images, and I will tell you a thing or two about each image. And, uh, but before that, I will, uh, I will point out two things that I think are important uh, when it comes to understanding my art. First is why is it on cardboard? And then uh, why farm workers? Well, I happen to, uh, to draw, to have seen art on cardboard prior to, uh, to graduate school because I went to, be, to see some shows and I saw some art that was on cardboard and I thought that was interesting. And so when I, when I went back to school, I decided uh, that uh, cardboard, specifically produce cardboard, boxes could be a good element to add some context to the figures. Uh, the first piece that I did uh, on cardboard was uh, a banana man on, man on a banana box. Uh, I, I think uh, I was trying to, um, which by the way coincided what I was, which what I wanted to, to say on my art, uh, which was uh, try to speak um, or rather contrast the wealthy versus the working class. The wealthy being uh, represented by the labels on the boxes and the working class by the mark makings. And, and then why farm workers? Well, I happen to, to work in the fields of Eastern Washington State uh, from the beginning of, of my college years. And it was, uh, Oh, thank you to my brothers and sisters, by the way, who fed me and gave me shelter while I literally save up all my paychecks for school. Um, at first it was for the money, right? But then when, when I was doing uh, the research for my thesis uh, show, I realized that I was, uh, I was part of the community. I was part of that community. I was part of that community that, that was oppressed by the, by the, by the system. Uh, of that community that lacked uh, basic things like uh, health insurance or even a decent place to live. And then I decided to shift my focus a bit and decided to paint as to honor uh, these individuals and decided to paint them uh, on, to paint them in my art. So now we can, we can, uh, we, we can jump to the image now. This is, um, this image right here, it's literally for me, uh, honoring a, a family that I made in the fields. And I want to also to acknowledge the risks and, and difficulties that all these uh, workers have to go through by the rather sinister images or image on my, on my left. That image alone has its own long story that if you want to know more about it, just DM me and I'll tell you all about it. But we can go to the next image. The, the sculpture one was a response to the, uh, to the now President of the United States when he was campaigning back in 2016. And he said all those negative comments about Latino immigrants. And I decided to make a piece that would show the contribution of the Latino people. And I, I draw these uh, farm workers kind of emptying their, their product of their label, labor. And in order to do this, I had to I had to play with the media of collage. And this is by ripping off images of all different boxes and gluing them together as to create these bounty of produce, bringing by the farm workers. So the next image, I believe, uh, are the uh, portraits. Yes, the uh, unnumbered portrait series and the ghost portrait series. 
this was pretty much about um, zooming in and looking at each individual uh, at a, at a close-up. And everyone is wearing uh, a mask or a bandana on, and this is for their own protections. Uh, farm workers wear masks or, or bandanas to protect themselves from the harsh weather conditions, uh, from the uh, residues, the chemical residues that are found in the branches, um, such as pesticides. And, um, and one of the sad things that I noticed while I was working in, in, in the fields is that whenever they work by the hour, it's kind of bearable to, to wear these masks or bandanas. But when it comes to working by the contract, because they have to make the most out of the, uh, the, most of the time that they have, uh, many of them get rid of their bandanas or, 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 the, um, or their masks because of there's no more foggy uh, goggles or there's no more, or, or breathing is easy, easier. And so sadly, uh, these individuals expose themselves to these uh, danger chemicals. Uh, the next images are um, uh, philosophy in the fields. That image is like, it's more about discussion. It's more, I think, I think it's, more about discussion, and I titled this Philosophy in the Fields because it kind of gave me the opportunity to um, speak about issues that affected farm workers wh while we were at a launch time. And we would gather together, speak about uh, what, what are some of the issues that we face day by day. Um, is it really hard? Like, is it really hot today? Was it really hot today? Um, was it really cold? Uh, my back is killing me and all these issues that comes with uh, working in the fields. And, and, and one of the things that for me stood up a lot was like, how can we get out of this? And, um, and obviously uh, uh, someone who actually uh, was able to go through all these uh, difficulties to go to school and get a college degree and realize that I was oppressed by the system. And, it, it, and, and, and so I would always suggest education. Education was or is actually one of the ways to get out of the fields. Not that there's anything wrong with working in the fields. I think uh, it's totally doable, but I think that when, uh, when one has a uh, certain kind of education, has the courage and the words perhaps to, to demand better uh, working conditions or better payment. And I would always encourage them to go to school. Of course, there was always this idea of like, I'm too old to go back to school. I'm too tired to go to school. To, to get a book and educate myself, which is sort of totally understandable because uh, uh, someone who worked there, all I wanted to do was after work was get a home, get a drink and, you know, and just chill. So, uh, but I would always encourage them to encourage their kids to go to school uh, as, so that organically perhaps we will uh, have that courage to, to say, hey, I think this is not fair. I think, uh, I think uh, the whole agricultural industry is not, is not uh, doing their fair share with the workers or maybe find a different job. And that makes me proud to see a uh, younger generation going out there, graduating, and, um, and then just being there in the world, um, uh, um, not only getting different kinds of jobs, but also going back many times to the same communities advocating for uh, these individuals. So what's the next image? I believe the next image is a triptych with emphasis on the, uh, on the graduate, right. I want to show, uh, this is, I made this for my thesis show. I didn't want my thesis show to be all about cardboard boxes. I wanted to show the worthiness of the farm worker being represented in art. And so I depicted three generations. I really, for me, it was really important for it to be all females and focusing on the graduate. Uh, as I already mentioned, graduation, going to college is one of the ways to better ourselves and to get out of the fields. The next image I believe is uh, always fresh. This image was uh, made at the Long Beach Museum of Art back in 2018. And it was right after I graduated, um, they invited me to do a residency with the culmination and option of having an exhibition in one of the galleries. And so I created this image thinking about the importance of the contribution, but more specifically uh, in 
the contribution to the economy of the United States. And therefore, it's hard to see in this image because it's kind of like uh, a large piece, but I borrowed some of the, some of the patterns from the, uh, from the dollar bill and, um, and used gold leaf to represent all that pattern. And I was really questioning to what cost do we have to go to create all these uh, beautiful and, and, and more and bigger and bigger and different kinds of produce, right? And also the central figure is a large female figure. Again, putting importance in the contributions of, of the women uh, in, the, in, in the front lines. The next image is uh, fresh cut the, cut, the beginning of a new day. And this image was one of the latest pieces I did for my solo show, uh, Charlie James Gallery, Super Fresh. And this, uh, the source of, the, of this drawing was an image that was taken during this last uh, picking season by one of my former co-workers. And he sent this image to me. And I noticed that while, while the, the, the worker is wearing safety goggles and is wearing gloves, but he's not wearing uh, proper boots, nor a mask or a bandana. And, and, and this was taken during, during the... Uh, during the lockdown of the pandemic. And so when I was working in the fields, I noticed all these rules and regulations where we would sit uh, uh, in front of a TV, watch a video, and, uh, and see all these different ways of how to take care of ourselves while working in the fields, uh, such as uh, not going up to the last uh, step of the ladder or wearing proper boots. But I feel like it was, ne it was rarely or never enforced. And I wonder if, um, I wonder if it was a, a, a strategy just because in this way, farm workers are more efficient, uh, but also expose themselves to the dangers. And maybe uh, the companies uh, were playing a blind eye to eye so that, the, the, so that there were more production. And so this makes me wonder, um, right now during the pandemic, given that farm workers are now deemed essential workers, are there gonna be positive changes uh, within at a legislative la level or um, is it gonna be business as usual once um, the, the whole noise goes away? And thank you, that was my, my rather fast presentation. Thank you so much, Narciso, and, and don't leave yet. Uh, I want you to stay there, and I will welcome up the uh, other speakers to the Zoom stage. And uh, while they're coming on board, I just want to really um, uh, emphasize the importance of the work that you're doing in bringing images of uh, essential workers, of farm workers, uh, of uh, Mexican descent or Latino, uh, workers in the United States into places like galleries and muse museums and schools. And that it's so critical that these spaces, which we see as hallmarks of our society and of our culture, include these images, because otherwise uh, these people, these workers, uh, these uh, fellow Americans uh, really remain invisible outside of the rather heroic efforts that are being undertaken by uh, activists uh, and, and um, uh, labor rights people like the folks that we've listened to and seen, heard from today. So with that, uh, if everybody is here, and I'm not sure if, if we're able to all um, uh, <clears throat> be uh, online here together and kind of go back and forth as a, in a dialogue, but we have about 20 minutes. <clears throat> And what I'd like to um, see if we can do is, is kind of speak to some of the spaces in between uh, what everyone has, has presented. There's been a lot of overlap and there's been a lot of um, uh, kind of good points marked out. But one of the things that strikes me, and, and I'm sure it's shared by uh, many people in the audience as well, is what can we do? We, we've heard what each of you are doing and the way it's contributing. <clears throat> and we've also heard where the limits are. Uh, Dolores really laid out, I think, a clear vision of, of ultimately where the goal is and, and the point of uh, orientation that we have. 
But I'm wondering if just any thoughts about that in terms of the different registers we've heard, which are the ethical and the moral. Uh, we've heard the legal. And then we've heard just the, the simple fact of facts, of information being out there that we know, that we see, that we're aware of uh, as part of how we live in, in the world. And, and the principle that's been held out by, uh, I think just about everybody, that uh, of being in a democratic society. Um, and yet, in a way, uh, we've come back to the democratic society that our country started with, uh, which is that those that are part of the decision-making, part of the, the kind of uh, thinking through of what the society is, are a fairly small and limited part of the actual population. Um, Gabby, I was, I was kind of interested in terms of your work as a political director and just really kind of where do you think you're able to really push forward and where do you hit a brick wall and, and how might one begin to get around that or over it or knock it down? So I, I think that I can't underestimate how essential we need um, the federal support for essential workers, not just healthcare workers, but those who were completely left out that Jess talked about, um, support to our localities that are preparing right now for the unfortunate situation where we see a second wave come through. Um, and because we were shut down for so long and because uh, we had to continue to provide services, we're seeing a real deficit that can only be solved with federal support. Um, and so I can't stress enough how important it is to get the federal government to act on behalf of essential workers, but really just communities that um, are going to need ongoing support in order for vital services to continue, regardless of the color of the skin of the folks that provide these vital services. So I think number one, um, that's important. And, and number two, we have to realize the power that we have and in voting in this election and, and regardless of, of, of who we're going to vote for, and I have to work hard as a kind of partisan hack <laughs> by trade, not to keep this nonpartisan, but, tr but truly, I think if you look at um, wherever you come on a political spectrum, if you just look at this country's response to the COVID crisis uh, and ask yourself, did the folks that are in elected office, whether it's your mayor, your counselor, your supervisor, your senator, your member of Congress, your president, did they do everything in their power to provide the essential support that is needed to do essential work? And really let that sit <laughs> with yourself and analyze that yourself. And you'll come to the conclusion that you need to go about who are the people you need to support and vote for in this upcoming election? And who are the people that you need to mobilize in your community whether it's your friends, your families, and your neighbors to be able to support this work. And the, the voices um, in, in organizing, we call it relational organizing, but it's really just organizing that everyone has done since the beginning of time and talking to the people that you know first and expanding that circle. And because, of, because we're still in this pandemic and traditional ways we have to engage um, and advocate for policies are all digital. Now they're all on Zoom, they're all on phones. It's gonna require us to talk to our friends and our families and our neighbors like nothing before. Just when I got off of this, my mom and my, my parents live in Kentucky. My mom asked me where Mitch McConnell was on this. And I told her and she was like, I'm calling him tomorrow. And I was like, I can't believe I haven't told my mom to call him already. That was, my, <laughs> that was me failing as an organizer. But there, there's so much work that we can do. And I think we all know folks who are in states that have, um, well, that's the officials that can really make an impact um, right now and engaging yeah. them is going to be so critical. You really hit upon something important that, and, and my sense has been that in terms of any collective effort to change something for the better, um, you really fall back on what are core labor organizing skills, which is to say that while everybody may share um, circumstances, they don't necessarily see eye to eye. And they don't necessarily have to, but you have to agree on what your goals are and how you get there. Now, I'm wondering, and I want to turn to Dolores for this, because she, she's really got the, the broad view and the big picture. You know, over a century ago, um, uh, Sinclair Lewis wrote a book called The Jungle, and it was about meatpacking, basically, mm -hmm. and the atrocities of that. Um, and what happened is he said, I aimed for the heart and I hit the stomach. 
So people got disgusted and upset about the food, but not the food worker, right? How do, how do you message that, Dolores? How in, in the many worlds in which you move and the people that you engage with, how do you shift that perspective from, how do I respond in terms of how it affects me? Oh, essential workers are, are uh, endangered? Make them keep working, because uh, that affects me. How do you change that? I think we have to kind of uh, constantly remind people. Uh, we were like, I think, uh, months into the pandemic uh, when a friend of mine who uh, is working now for the Los Angeles Times called me and she said, we want to do something about farm workers because they're not even mentioning farm workers as essential workers. It's like part of that, those invisible people, you know, that keep the country going and keep the country fed and they, they weren't even being mentioned at all. And I think we just have to always make that a constant reminder to people that these are the invisible workers that no one sees. Again, going back to slavery days, you know, when slaves did all the work, but nobody, uh, these great mansions that they had uh, there in the South, but you never saw the people that really did the work. And so we have to constantly remind people. And I'm so glad that Gabby brought up the HEROES Act, because in the HEROES Act, there is a provision uh, for hazard pay. Uh, for essential workers. And this uh, particular provision of the HEROES Act would actually cover not only farm workers, but undocumented farm workers also. As Gavin Newsom did here in California, they gave a stipend of $500 uh, and $1,000 for a family, but it's just a one-time, uh, you might say, gift that the, that the state gave. And so it, we constantly remind people, you know, one of the uh, issues that we didn't really mention is that when we talk about the children of farm workers and uh, what is happening now with the pandemic, when you have so many of these children that are at home right now, and so many of the parents, uh, they do not have the skills to help them out, you know, when, and so many of them didn't even have computers to begin with. This is one of the work that our foundation did is to make sure that the school districts did provide uh, the, uh, the children uh, with some kind of a tablet so they could keep up their studies. But again, uh, the, when one of the family had to stay home uh, with, one of the, uh, of the farm worker family had to stay home with the children, that cut their income in half because that not, both parents could not go to work. And our children, they do not have, they do not have uh, internet. You know, they don't have internet. And so they had some of these hotspots. So the educational uh, quality of, of, that our children are being given the farm worker children is really, really bad. So we're gonna to have to do so much in terms of catching up because you know, they're already getting a very poor ed education to begin with. And our foundation uh, is, you know, we're uh, co constantly campaigning to raise the educational levels of our kids and to get them quality education. In fact, right now we're working on a proposition in California called Proposition 15. And we're asking everybody to vote on this proposition. It will bring in 12, billion dollars into our school system by making the large uh, corporate uh, enterprises like Disney and Chevron and Amazon pay their fair share of taxes. Okay, it's going to be a, a big fight. But these are the things that we have to do. We have to get involved in, in policy and as I mentioned before in voting and seeing where we can get the funding that needs to be coming into our communities so that we can improve the quality of education for our kids. You no, know, exactly. And, and I think something similar is happening in school districts and, and universities and colleges in terms of requiring an ethnic studies uh, course. And it's part of really giving uh, people that broader understanding of who we are uh, and, and in terms of what you were saying about the, the human race, because the, the issue about racism is there are the humans and then there are the other races. <laughs> Uh, now, Narciso, I want to ask you in terms of your own experience, uh, you've, you've spoken very eloquently about the work that you do, and the work is very compelling. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, the on the ground stuff of when you have a show in a museum or a gallery, and what kind of conversations do you have with folks? Do you have people that are not uh, Latinx or not uh, uh, immigrants or farm workers coming and, and how do they engage with the work? What do you, what hope or possibilities or issues do you see? Well, I, th I think it's really, um, for me, when, when I first uh, started um, doing the research for my thesis and I decided that I was going to honor farm workers in my art, 
I was literally thinking that. Like, I didn't want to go into abstract art because I, even, I, I find, not that I don't find abstract art interesting, but I really wanted to, to emphasize the figures so that the farm workers could see themselves in the art as being worthy of being represented. And, and I, I, while I was always trying to focus on the community and art for the community, uh, because I was in an institution that, in an institution that uh, was uh, pretty much within the art world, every time I would show, it was always shifted from, ga from, from my school to galleries, to museum, to cur curators. And it was kind of difficult to move on to the community. And, uh, and so I decided uh, to, I decided that this was, wasn't a bad thing. On the contrary, I, I, I decided that it was a, a good thing because if anything, it brings the messages to different audiences that are not familiar with farm workers, with, uh, with audiences that perhaps never have seen a, a, a farm worker or they never cross their minds where their food comes from. But when, when the art is at a gallery or the art is purchased by a, a huge corporation or, or at a museum where, where, let's face it, farm workers rarely or never have been, um, at least they are getting the message through. Now, when it comes to the, to the community, I have done certain things that, uh, that I'm, I'm still trying to bring the art to the community by making uh, vinyl prints because of the nature of my work and I cannot bring cardboard to the, to the outside of a community, but I can do vinyl prints life-size vinyl prints that are, can be hanged uh, at, a, at a store. Mm -hmm. Luckily, uh, we've, I've been engaged with the city, or rather my brother has been helping me with these, but he is kind of like um, the man who's like in front of the work and, and, and go like, oh, let's do this to the city, let's make the city. Be in, involved with this so that there are more opportunities to show the work in other institutions, not just the street. So yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, there, there is some art that is hanging in the community that I worked for uh, in the past, and they're also included in the local library where I work in it, and hopefully in the future there will be more. But I think in terms of uh, what you said, what's it that I want with my art in the galleries? I think it's precisely that. Engage mm -hmm. with people that are not familiar with farm workers yeah. with conversations about farm workers. So yeah, uh, you've already gotten a request here from Arte Americas in Fresno, California about wanting to exhibit your work. Uh, maybe you can put an email or something into the uh, chat for the uh, panelists and participants. Uh, we can also follow up uh, with them as well. I wanna thank you for that. And, and I know our time is running close, but I, I wanna throw one of the questions from the audience out to Jess, which is really, I think a very important question. And it gets back to what Dolores really uh, put out as a challenge to, to try to think beyond race as a way of dividing people. And so the question has to do with what role, if any, do you see for economically disadvantaged whites in the struggle for equality? We, we've seen the way in which they've been captured um, by a political uh, movement that, that may voice some frustrations they have, but don't serve their interest. So how do you, on the other side of that, um, how do you see the connection there? Um, yeah, it's a really, it's a really good question. Um, you know, at NWA, we are a multiracial organization. And um, I say that because I think that sometimes people think that equity, um, and inclusion conversations are only about people of color and they're not just about people of color, they are also about white people. Um, and that's why part of why we identify as multiracial. We're not just trying to create um, a kind of um, identity silo, although those spaces are extremely valuable as well. Um, but actually we believe strongly that people need to come together to be able to work across um, race difference uh, to actually move forward collectively. So ultimately we believe deeply that organizing is essential to creating a multiracial democracy. Um, because frankly, it's the only way we've ever gotten anything. Like that's why we have rights in this country is because people have organized over the course of our country's history and demanded their rights that they should have had from the beginning. 
-hmm. At the same time, it is just, I think, incredibly important to just say out loud that not everyone, even economically disadvantaged white people, are affected in the same way um, around um, how racism exists in the economic sphere. So we believe deeply that all workers deserve dignity and respect on the job, and all really does mean all. At the same time, we know that some workers are, have less access to dignity and respect than their peers, even among those across um, similar types of industries. Um, even just the fact people are domestic workers is often a function of their immigration status. It's because they literally cannot get another job because of their immigration status. So it's important to recognize who is being affected the most and also be clear that all are welcome and that all are needed to get to the collective solution that we seek. If we want America to become the type of democracy that has equal pay for everybody, where people can um, access health care for free if they get sick, um, and where people have the chance to worry about only you know, the regular things that happen in their families instead of giant systems of oppression, it will take all of us working together. And I think white folks who want to engage in anti-racism work, you know, the most important advice that I would give is you really need to listen. That's, I yeah. think that's like the first most important thing is to listen. And then understand that the work includes you and, and this is really important, you will make mistakes. You will be uncomfortable. You will do the wrong thing. So if you are attempting to engage in anti-racist work, you should just know you're going to mess up. Don't worry. It's happened before a lot <laughs> and yeah. be okay with that. Um, and, and then move beyond that, because that's actually how we get to the change that we're looking for. No, that's, that's really great because um, it really goes back again to the hallmarks of early democracy and the hallmarks of labor organizing. Um, to, listening is such a key part of that. And also the presumption that while you share experiences, while you share circumstances and even goals, doesn't mean you necessarily agree and you have to work at that. Now, uh, before I, I bring uh, Christine Kim back to say final farewells, I want to thank each of you, Jess, uh, Dolores, uh, Narciso, Gabby, for really wonderful presentations and the dialogue. Uh, and it's something that I think we could definitely continue. I want to thank all of the partners that made this possible uh, in collaboration with LACMA, but also Christine, uh, Cello, Jess, and Chris, Mirabai, Kat, Ellie, Connor, Richie, Everybody behind the scenes at LACMA that's making this possible. Uh, it's, it's been a great experience and it's really so important to be able to have this kind of dialogue. So with that, Christine, can you uh, uh, close this? Thank out? you so much, Chong. Thank you, Jess, Dolores, Gabby, Narciso. What an illuminating evening. I think as someone said earlier, um, it's an exciting and wonderful talk and it brings up topics that are extremely troubling and depressing and difficult, um, but all things that we need to be thinking about at this moment. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said, a budget is a moral document. And this is the moment when we need the support for the people we count on the most. And those people we count on the most, yes, they do happen to be brown, black, AAPI, immigrant, et cetera. Um, and those stark lines are really telling us things that a lot of us have already known for many, many years, mere years, and have been working to working against and trying to bring new models, new paradigms, new awarenesses of. And you all are part of that project, and I am so grateful. Um, thank you, Chan, for thanking everyone from the co-presenters all the way down to the people behind the scenes. It is like the Wizard of Oz, except in reverse, this looks seamless. And then in the back, it's super, super complicated and many um, experts and technicians, I think them all. I think um, in the art world, there is a sense that people have that kind of elitism or exclusivity is the way that the art world operates or should operate. And I think if there's anything that people should see in the art world or and beyond um, through the pandemic is that this is really a more is more moment. So in partnering with Four Freedoms, Arte Americas, Jopo, Stop Discrimination, Four Freedoms, and LACMA, that's just one way in which it exemplifies. I mean, we would, would never have this many hosts, right, for one public program. 
but in this era where all of that we're bringing together and want to share um, openly and as freely as we can to as many people who are also engaged in these dis discussions and want to together make movement forward, um, and especially within an art and culture context, where we have other channels through art like nar Narcissos or poetry and painting and sculpture, performance, so on and so forth, where we want to continue talking about these things, expand the platforms, find new models together and keep the discussion going. Thank you for all the work that you're doing. Thank you all co-hosts and partners for collaborating with us on this incredible series, Racism, Racism is a Public Health Issue. It is, and we will continue to discuss these topics. Have a wonderful evening. Good night.